Thank you for the introduction. I would like to start with a standard scenario. The scenario is when the program reads from an input file and produces an output. Now, when, when you think more about it, many programs don't read the whole file all at once. Instead, they chop down the file into individual input units and process them one at a time. For example, applications of this form include servers that process requests, video players that process video frames, data analytics that process rows in very large tables, and so on. Unfortunately, programs have bugs. A program may enter unanticipated corner cases if there's an unanticipated input unit. As a result, the program may crash and produce no output. Now, some of you may think that this situation is easy to avoid, but is that true? To find out, we did a user study. We asked participants at MIT to write a small program that generates thumbnails for images. The input format is, like, looks like this. Each row has an image which contains a name, a scaling factor, a height, a width, and a list of pixels. In this example, since there are four rows and four columns, the image looks like this. The output contains the name and the list of pixels. To calculate this output, first determine the dimensions for the image. In this case, it's two rows and two columns. Then each pixel of the thumbnail is calculated by taking the average values of each of the corresponding areas. So we gave this small programming task to those participants and asked them to write a program that can, gen that can handle arbitrary inputs by skipping malformed images. Guess what happened? It turns out that their programs had lots of bugs. Here's a summary of the bugs that we found. Each row is a possible type of bug. Each column is a participant. We mark letter X where the program has such a bug. I'll come back to this table later in this talk, but let's first take a quick look at what some of these bugs look like. What's the problem with this code? It uses the variable s as the divisor without checking whether the input value is zero or not. So this bug can be triggered by illegal inputs that are anticipated, unanticipated. What's the problem with this code? It allocates an array using the size h times w. Now, if this, this result is too large that it overflows the integer representation, it may become a small positive integer. Afterwards, when the program uses a calculated expression to access the array, it may go beyond the actual size. So this bug can be triggered by legal input in extreme cases. What's the problem with this code? It may go beyond, right beyond the array. Note that even though the developer has made an effort to check the array bound during the loop, it still has the error after the loop. So this bug can be triggered by legal inputs, and it's there just because the developer made a mistake. So what you, you should take away from these examples is that it's not so simple to write programs that can handle arbitrary inputs. So what's going on here? Let's look at these inputs in terms of the bugs in the programs. Here's a set of all the possible inputs. Here's a set of the legal input units that satisfy the specification, and the rest are illegal. There's a set of input units where the program doesn't crash. Outside of this set, the program has bugs and may crash. For, exa for example, uh, because of unanticipated input, uh, illegal input values, or even if they're legal, it, there may still be extreme cases or developer mistakes. So we call this, this set of input units that cause crashes as bad input units. Now let's go back to uh, look at these bad input units in the context of the program execution. We know that when the program has a bug, people will sometimes come in to fix it. Here's one possible way to fix these kinds of bugs. We can add a sanity check so uh, to detect those corner cases so that the next time the program reads the input unit, it discards it and continues execution as if the bad input unit has never existed. Now the question is, how frequently do developers fix bugs in this way in practice? It turns out that this conceptual behavior appears repeatedly across a wide range of applications. Here are examples from an earlier paper. Input units can be network packets, 
images, message options, or uh, CSS attributes. In all these applications, the developers, uh, all, all these applications had input units of different forms, and their developers fit the box by discarding the bad input units. In practice, you may notice that some of these applications behave slightly differently. For example, they may print some partial outputs that don't have a chance to be cleaned up, or they may print a brief error message. That said, still all these applications share the same underlying behavior, which is they, they discard those bad input units that are not so important, and then keep, con keep continued execution to produce the rest of the valuable results. Um, this bug fixing strategy can also benefit other applications. For example, embedded systems, network routers, or other programs that process other input units. Now that this same conceptual behavior appears repeatedly in all these places, let's take a step back and think about how to enforce it in these applications. There's actually a lot of ad hoc ways to implement this same behavior, but as I have uh, discussed late, earlier and we'll discuss later, these ad hoc implementations are usually er error prone. That's why we propose a new way to do this automatically. So here's the idea. We propose a new programming abstraction to help the program to automatically discard bad input units and continue execution to produce valuable results. We decided to provide the abstraction as a new language construct so that developers can use it as a, at a higher level. Know that it's, it is definitely possible to implement it just as a library or just use it as a software design pattern. As long as it is provided as an abstraction, it works. So here's how we did it. The new language construct is called filter iterators. To use it, the, to use it to process a sequence of input units, the developer does two things. First, specify how to split the input file into input units. Second, how to process each input unit. Then, the filtered iterator automatically does the following. First, it iterates over the input units so that the program can process them one at a time. Next, it uses a transaction to wrap around the processing code. If the processing succeeds, the transaction commits. If there's an error during the processing code, for example, for un, if it's an unhandled exception or a failed assertion, then the transaction aborts, which, which rolls back the partial updates to the program state and program outputs that are caused by the current bad input unit. As a result, the program continuous execution as if all those bad input units don't exist. So we call this language construct a filter iterator because as it iterates over input units, it uses the execution errors as the criterion to filter out bad input units for the program so that it can continue execution. Let's make sure that everyone is on the same page here. Let's think about which input units Will end up will end up in the final result of the program. Recall that the processing code may have bugs and may crash sometimes, and only this set of input units will execute without crashing. All the rest are bad input units that cause runtime errors. The language automatically discards these bad input units. As a result, the program automatically recovers from um, the runtime errors because the language discards those bad input units. And that is also why, even though the processing code may still have bugs, it doesn't crash anymore. Instead, it continues execution as if the bad input unit doesn't exist. Note that we do not intend to discard all the illegal input units, because even if, even if the program only sees legal input units, and if it has a bug, it may still crash. Okay, now let me show you what it looks like if we build filter iterators in a small research language called RIFL, short for Robust Input Filtering Language. It is, note that it is just our research vehicle for evaluating the concept of filter iterators. The syntax is as follows. 
protect files is the keyword inspect t followed by a loop condition, a file handle, and a delimiter to specify the end of each input unit. For example, to process CSV or comma separated values, the program may use a filtered iterator to first split the input file into separate lines and then use a second filter iterator to, to split each row into separate columns. For binary files, the syntax is the keyword inspect B followed by a loop condition, a file handle, and two values O and W to specify where to find the length field for each input unit. For example, to process PCAP files that contain network packets, a program may use a filtered iterator to, to find the four byte length field that starts at the 12th byte of each network packet. Now, how to know if this idea of filtered iterators is good or not? How to know um, what, how, in which ways will this new programming abstraction affect the way that people write programs? To evaluate this idea, we decided to do the user study. We recruited participants from computer science, graduate students, and postdocs at MIT. We randomly divided the participants into two groups, where the only difference was the use of filtered iterators. The repo group used filtered iterators, and the control group used the same language excluding filtered iterators, so that they had to use standard language constructs to handle the errors. We gave them the thumbnail generator task, and the task was unlimited in time. They all finished within 75 minutes. Recall that the input in the image, in the input format, there are multiple images, which is similar to other image formats. Each row uh, is an image. Each image is an input unit. The correct output for this example is on the right. And this is what we gave the participants. However, these are just B9 input units that satisfy the specification and look very typical. We tested those programs using illegal input units that don't set satisfy the specification. For example, they may have a letter where it's supposed to be an integer. We also used tricky input units, which still satisfy the specification, but the program may still have errors if it's not prepared. For example, if the image dimensions are too large and the program doesn't check for the image size before allocating memory, it may, it may crash. When we told participants to write a program that can handle arbitrary inputs by skipping malformed images, one, one desirable output is shown on the right, which skips all the illegal and all those tricky images. However, we also accepted a few other, a few other possible outputs that were reasonable when handling rare cases. Here's a summary of all the defects that we found in all those programs. On the right, it's the control group, which, which I've shown you earlier. On the left is the RIFO group. So there are five participants in each group. There were fatal defects, which included memory errors, divided by zero errors, and infinite loops. There were non-fatal defects, which include memory leaks and producing incorrect outputs in certain corner cases. Let's look at the fatal defects in the control group. There's a lot of them. Every program had at least two fatal defects. In comparison, the refill group had zero fatal defect. If you think about this, you can see why. It's because the filter iterators already automatically handled those random errors. What about the errors that don't, don't cause crashes? In the control group, they still have a lot of non-fatal defects. For example, when processing some strange input units, the programs may corrupt their data across different input units, or they may get desynchronized between the boundaries of input units or they may produce undesirable partial outputs, even if they have detected a bad input unit. On the other hand, the repo group didn't have those kind of errors. And the only defects in the repo group were memory leaks and just missing some checks to roll out illegal data. What you should take away from this table is that the control group had a lot of bugs. And in contrast, repo group don't do not crash, and even for the non-fatal errors, there's also fewer. 
what do these programs look like? We measured the programs in terms of cyclomatic complexity, which measures the complexity of the control flow. In this plot, the control group is yellow and ripple group is green. Each data point is a program. For example, this number two participant program has a cyclomatic complexity of about 24. We also measured the code size in terms of lines of code. You can see although there was some variation between different participants, so this, there's this general trend which is the repo groups programs use, using filter iterators were simpler and smaller than the control group programs. We think there are two main reasons. First, since filter iterators already handle errors automatically, developers can omit unnecessary checks for crashes. Secondly, even when handling those errors that don't necessarily lead to crashes, developers can also simplify their code because they can just write assertions to discard those undesirable bad input units, and they don't have to elaborate error recovery code, for example, uh, rolling back program state or output or synchronizing between input units. What all these numbers tell us is that filter iterators help to clean up the code so that developers can focus on the main functionality rather than all those problematic corner cases. Are there limitations? Sure. Using filter iterators can be difficult to debug because they sometimes make unintentional errors silent. To avoid this problem, the language implementation should provide an error log or some kind of IDE support so that in, so that the developers can at least investigate which input units were discarded and why. Also note that we assume that the program processes structured input units and it's desirable to obtain partial results over terminating execution. Here's the related work. Compared to exception handling, we do two important things. One is transactional rollback. Second is discarding bad input units. Compared to other techniques to recover program errors by manipulating the execution, we provide a different semantics, which is discarding input units atomically. Compared to other language designs that combine transactions and exception handling, we, provide, we have a different goal, which is to allow those programs that process input units to just throw away those bad input units and continue execution to produce valuable outputs. Here's the conclusion. We propose a new program in abstraction called filtered iterators. What it does is they, they iterate over input units, filter out bad input units when errors occur using atomic rollback of updates. This design is inspired by how developers fix bugs in practice and a a user study shows that this new program abstraction enables more robust and simpler programs. I'm happy to take questions. <laughs>